Hello viewers and welcome to Daily Politics. On this program, we discuss issues around politics, policy and governance. I'm Hamza Idris. Upon the aspiration of a one-week ultimatum given to Niger Kupist by the President Bola Tinubu led a course to return the Ustad President Mohamed Bazoum of first military action, the Adama Junda remains unyielding. While both sides gradually take deterrence measures such as cutting off of diplomatic ties, power supply, border and airspace closure in the face of growing tension, the possibility of impending proxy war between the Nigeria-led Air Corps forces and Russia backed by Nigerian military junta remains on the table amidst wider consultations and growing words of caution. This is just as war economy experts project that the Niger invasion could cost about 3 trillion naira, save a long-term diplomatic understanding and deepen humanitarian crisis along the border states. They also believe the war will further have negative impact on the ongoing fight against insurgency in the volatile Sahel region. Already, the Nigerian Senate has turned down request by President Tinubu to be allowed to invoke relevant section of the 1999 constitution to restore democratic order in Niger Republic and instead call for more diplomatic engagement for amicable resolution of the regional political crisis. Now the big questions. Will the ECOWAS succumb to the voices of wisdom and discard a needless war in Niger Republic? How could the outcome of a high-powered meeting of ECOWAS military chiefs holding in Abuja affect the current atmosphere of uncertainty? Should the military junta in Niger be allowed to get away with the affront on democracy? What are the available options? And to discuss this and more, we have in the studio Dr. Omar Ardo, a seasoned politician and international affairs commentator. He has also taught at the Nigerian Defense Academy, and his line of interest is political history. Welcome to our program, Doctor. Thank you, Hamza. We're happy <clears throat> having you. But before the discussion proper, let's take a look at some tidbits in the political scene. Uh, the Senate had a rowdy session today where uh, Festus Kiamo was vigorously grilled by the senators there to the extent that uh, Senate President got, uh, had to go to the presidential villa, had a tete a tete with President Bola Tinubu, and then returned to the Senate where they carried on with the conversation. Yes, uh, Doctor, mm. welcome. I think before we start the main topic of the day, maybe to have your take on the grilling of um, Festus Kiamu. It appeared different from others. I'm sure maybe you have monitored how the senators approach quite a number of controversial issues, but that of Festus was unprecedented. They, they you know, they, they asked him many questions that um, he slighted them at a certain time. The House of Reps invited him to go and defend some of his actions and inactions while serving as minister. He rebuffed them and all that, and therefore he should not be confirmed. Yeah, uh, if you follow the antecedents of uh, mm. Festus Kiamu, yeah. SAN, especially during the Muhammad Buhari regime, he's been very belligerent with the uh, National Assembly. Oh. I know severally they invited him. Not only did he not come, but he didn't have kind words, you know, towards uh, them. But uh, my worry is that why is it that the uh, the motion for his uh, uh, on against him yes. was moved by Senator Abaribe from the southeast, and it was also seconded. No, uh, was it? Uh, Senator Ococha, o o yeah, and, yeah. you know, Southeastern Senator. Senator Darlington, yeah. Darlington, Yes, yeah. who moved the motion and Abaribe seconded, or is it yeah. Abaribe that moved it and, but... Abaribe it's, seconded, it's, yeah, yes, it's, exactly. Yes, it's that zone. Yeah. So I don't know whether it has some kind of... Uh, regional... Uh, regional yeah. outlook. Maybe there is a problem between the Southeast, you know, and then the Delta region... Yeah. ...of... Uh, of, of uh, oh, Nigeria. ...the South... Uh, mm. ...the South South. Yeah. So, Whatever it is, I think uh, we should not allow uh, personal issues, you know, to override national uh, issues. Yes, so exactly. I hope they will uh, they will uh, clear him. We are, we incidentally, that they clear him. Yeah. Incidentally, mm. he's the only 
a minister in the Buhari regime that has been brought back, you know, into into the cabinet by Bola Tinubu uh, regime. I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. I think I think you are right because I, I can't see any other one. Of not, course, not it's the most, uh, you know, yes. biggest in size, yeah. uh, the, 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 the ministers. And even him, you know, it was actually after a series of um, bullying, let me put it, because there was cyber bullying against him. You know, he stood firmly with um, Tinubu during the election, even though he was serving as minister, but he was unrelenting in protecting Tinubu against cyber attacks and all that. Yeah. And uh, during the first list, his name was not there. I really pity the man, doctor. Because, Why? Uh, yes, the social media warriors, they descended on him and said, okay, you took the whole of your energy to Tinubu and you are not even grateful during Buhari because during the valedictory session, you said that... Uh, um, there was nothing like a minister of state, meaning you are not grateful. So you are now, you are now being paid in your own coin. coin. Yeah, it was really funny. But um, beyond this, how satisfied are you with the um, drilling of the ministerial nominees? Well, you know, these things, <laughs> they've already decided these things long before they were sent to the Senate. It's all the same clique. It's all, this one is in the executive and this one in the legislature. They have already discussed this thing you know, before they come into the Senate. So there wasn't much grilling. And even those who you would rather think that they should not you know, be cleared, mm. they have been cleared. Yeah. So many of them ought not to be cleared, but they have been cleared. So. I just don't want to discuss all exactly. this. Exactly. I know you know, you're not ready just, for that discussion, but yeah. of course, part of the issues of the day. But do you see them performing? I mean, despite, you know, we have a lot of expectation. It imagine. all depends on the president himself. Okay, it's about the president. All depends on the president himself. If the president leads by example, yes, then we will have results. Those who call for sacrifice, and the president has been calling for sacrifice. All right. Those who call for sacrifice must be seen sacrificing themselves. Mm. Because if you do not sacrifice and you call for sacrifice, nobody will listen to you. So leadership is actually by example. Leadership if the president yeah. is sincere mm. in his uh, leadership, then we will have results. But if he is there in order to satisfy vested interests, mm. then we are going to have, we will just we continue you know, with the sleaze that has been Nigerian leadership since uh, uh, the Obas and Julian office. Oh my God, I, I hope we get it right. Because we'll take a short break and uh, when we return the conversation of the day, war in Niger or impending war in Niger commences. Don't go away. Welcome back. Yes, we have Dr. Omar Arbo. You, you taught at the uh, Nigeria Defense Academy, and you know a lot. And that is your area of interest, as I said at the introductory part of this conversation, political history. Now, this issue in Niger, let's start with um, the, 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 the coup and then the action of the ECOWAS. Do, do they have the right? to do what they did? Okay, for you to understand uh, the actions of the Kupis in yeah. Niger, you need to take the background, understand the background of the Nigerian politics. Uh, Muhammad Yusuf led Niger as president for a period of about 10 years. Okay. And after the expiration of uh, two terms of 10 years, he inclined himself towards continuing. He had a prime minister, Hama Amadou, yes. who also had eye for the presidency. And Hama Amadou was very popular with the Nigerian people. And so Hama refused to in, uh, support the position of uh, his president mm. towards you know, elongating his their tenure. leadership. Yeah. Yes. So... Uh, then, in connivance with France and with the uh, deformed Buhari administration, 
uh, Muhammad Yusuf now brought in uh, Muhammad Bazoum. Oh. So, uh, so Nigeria had a hand in Yeah, in Muhammad that. Yusuf brought in Muhammad Bazoum, and then uh, uh, Hama Amadu was not happy. Okay. And Hama Amadu started you know, opposing it and trying to contest whether or not he had the support of the president. So while in France, for a visit, they charged him on, it was actually a trump up charge, I believe. Okay. They charged him on, I think, uh, uh, kin uh, not kidnapping, you know, abduction or something of a girl. Okay. And he was sentenced in abstentia. Wow. He was convicted in abstentia. And so he could not uh, come, come back. And, and also his, he was outlawed from contesting. Wow. And that was how Bazoum came in. And so uh, he opposed Bazoum even at that. So when they did the first round of election, Bazoum did not win. Bazoum so, did not win? No. So they had to go for a second round of election. Meaning he, even, he was even very popular. That, yeah. Even at that, Mahamadu was very popular. So even at that, Bazoum did not uh, uh, win convincingly. So quickly they, they, they worked for uh, a, a, government, a government of national unity, bringing this political party, bringing that political party. They did not go well with majority of the Nigerian people. And that was why there was an, an attempt to halt the inauguration of Mohammed Bazoum by the military. There was a coup plot yes. to halt that uh, uh, inauguration. And so uh, it was foiled you know, yes. by the support of uh, France and the Nigerian government. We now have Mrs. Faith Wadishi. She's uh, from Center for Transparency Advocacy and also uh, representing the original inhabitants cohort, right, at the event that uh, took place mm. today. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. We're Good happy evening. having you. Thank and you. Um, of course, you've seen it. We'll discuss that, which is our main topic. But um, the latest today is fresh sanction on Niger by ECOWAS, led by President Tinubu. Even though they were not clear, uh, Inglele, his spokesperson, said that um, they are using the CBN now to actually talk to the coupist in Niger in the language they will understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is your take on the latest development? Um, I think that um, one thing, though, I agree. I, I read the statement by Inglele, and one thing, though, is that we should understand that whatever action that the president is taking now is not taken as a person or as Nigeria as a country, but on behalf of ECOWAS, because he's the leader in ECOWAS. Yes. And the fact that um, they, they are now going to speak to them through the CBN, it means that it is money matters that is involved. And you know, when it is money matters that is involved, CBN is a clearing house for such money matters. Yeah. So even if they don't give us the details, what, um, I, um, what uh, I envisage is that having uh, stopped them from having electricity from Nigeria, and then the other part is, okay, so how you want to maybe block financial access. Yeah. And you know, that is, that is actually the end point when it comes to issues around negotiations. What are those things that you can hold people to, that if you take away from them, they will reconsider their stand. And globally, everywhere, finance is one of them, resources mm. is one of them. So if they have a significant stake in Nigeria, such that because of what they have in the ECOWAS, they have to pass through the Nigerian CBN, yeah. then mm. they can have something to say. And Nigeria is if also helping way. them significantly. Yes. So if Nigeria mm. is going it's to... It's a big sister. Na yes, Nigeria has Niger. cut off uh, electricity. If Nigeria is also going to cut off funds and some other support that... And border has maybe, been closed. Yes, yeah. warehoused by Nigeria. Maybe the ECOWAS support that is coming from other other uh, areas, mm. reductions, is warehoused by Nigeria in the CBN. They could use that as a negotiating point mm. to speak uh, to speak to the, the coupists in, in Niger. But again, 
again, it, it, we cannot say it is 100% because from the stories that are flying around, mm. they're having some other linkages, other places. Yes. So if you cut off that financial um, uh, sustenance or financial assets from them, from Nigeria, from ECOWAS, and they have other links, then you may actually stall that, neg that negotiation. Yes, so exactly. unless we agree, unless the government is sure, the ECOWAS is sure, that whatever support is coming from Nigeria through the CBN is significant. Yeah, if enough. If cutting off power was not significant enough to get them to change their mind, you know, after cutting off power and all of that, they, they severed their relationship with, with Nigeria. Yeah. So now we're going to be talking money. Maybe and they not have Naira. even closed their airspace? Uh, yes, they have definitely Nigeria. closed their airspace. So you cannot fly into Niger and, um, or fly out of uh, Niger. And you can see, the, the, so the, the, the long and short of it is that with the new sanction, mm -hmm. and because it is CBN related, it means it is money related. Exactly. And uh, another point they raised there quickly is um, that people should not trivialize the whole thing because mm -hmm. some, some see the punishment from ethnic perspective or religious perspective, but it's understood when you look at the belt from Sokoto to Borno, you have about six or seven states that have direct linkage with um, I, I, I know uh, why with, it's, with, it's, with it's even worrisome. I've yeah. had to travel by road to Niger. I was carrying out uh, a survey, so I had to do that trip by mm. road. I will tell you that at the time I traveled, we don't have borders, we only have rope. Exactly. That is the only thing that is there. You are staying in the Nigerian corner. You are seeing the Nigerian corner. Exactly. They have small boots you there. You can even cross and buy. And you can cross. You know, and then so the customs people, when they see maybe you're coming in the car, they just raise the rope exactly. for you. And then you come out, use your leg and cross. And it's, mm. So and th this is a country, whether we like it or not, Nigeria has supported this country. I know there was a time we were buying about 5,000 liters of uh, from e them. Exactly. When we were supposed to be producing 45,000, mm. when NMPC came out, yeah. we didn't hear anything about, mm. about all of that there was also a time we were planning a railway exactly. you know to go to niger so we have substantive investments in niger and if anything happens there the borders are so porous we're already grappling with insecurity in nigeria even along all of those houses how do we take care of the people the refugees because by the time they come into nigeria and also statistics says that we have about 300,000 refugees nigerians in niger so, we have so to be very it careful. is significant nigeria has to be concerned about what is happening especially along the fact that you're seeing Mali, you are seeing Burkina Faso, mm. you are seeing all of those countries that are just along those lines, close exactly. to Nigeria. The only country where we are not having uh, any any stress right now is from the Chadian area. Exactly. That's the only area where we are not having stress. So Nigeria and we had should it, actually not quite long. Yeah, you know, Nigeria because should of actually the, be interested in what Arab. happens there. All right, who should Tinubu tax and who should he exempt from his tax? Because I can see he's so passionate about raising the revenue base of Nigeria, reducing. Uh, borrowing, increasing our GDP. Um, it, very interesting. I like the fact that he has set up that uh, tax reform uh, committee, but the tax reform committee needs to also uh, take, take into cognizance the issues that we have with our tax. The issue of multiplicity of taxes. Now, let me tell you how that comes. I'm a business person in Nigeria. They set up a law, and they say that a certain percentage of uh, tax we go. For instance, we have the TET fund that is funded by 3%. We have the NDDC for companies that is also funded by another. We have the, uh, we have the Northeast Development uh, Commission. We have the police trust fund. We're also having the maritime trust fund. Mm. Some of all these funds, you are taking percentage of companies' uh, uh, taxes to fund them. So by the time you put all of them together, you see that companies are paying almost 30% tax. Uh -oh. You know, so it becomes a burden on people. And when you talk about uh, environment of ease of doing business, there's, mm. also, there's a prob there's a problem. Then you also talk about the fact that, in, for instance, if you travel out of this country, you go to other countries and you buy things, so you're not staying there for too long. At the airport, you can actually have tax refund, mm. but we don't have that in Nigeria. So as, as, a, as somebody who has come as a tourist, you have bought things, you have contributed to that, mm. and you are going back. Your taxes are not uh, are not refunded to you. Yeah. So it becomes it becomes uh, an issue. That's one. And again, the way that we have different taxes, for instance, even at gov uh, local government level, yes. you see they say tax force this. You are traveling on the road. Yeah. You have paid Life everything. Tax, like all the market tax. If, if you are traveling with some truck, like even with Sienna, I, I had an experience once. I was traveling. I had problems 
problem in Kogi, I had problem in Edo, I had I'm telling you, hey, bro, you know, everywhere, it. and they're asking you for things you have already paid for. Mm. Somebody will carry your paper and say, oh, this paper is not there. Right there and then they will take that tax. They will not give you a receipt for it. Then the woman in the market that is selling, yeah. maybe a bag of pure water, a bag of pure water that you buy for about 300 naira, mm. and you are going to sell and make a profit of just 100 naira or 50 naira. Then the tax person at the member of the tax force from the local government is coming to ask you to pay a tax of 120 naira on daily basis. Oh. If you look at the percentage of tax that you pay as a woman in the market versus the percentage of tax that is paid by companies or yeah. international organizations, you see that the woman in the market is paying is paying uh, uh, more taxes. Considering her income, that. right? Yes, considering her The taxable cost. income yes. is so, so... And in a situation wherever you see that even some of these international companies mm. are the ones who decide what percentage of taxes that they pay for themselves. Wow. So these are things that we need to... Uh, and, uh, and, and the president see. should... Yes, and the president... That this committee should look at and be sincere about it. Who is paying tax? Who is benefiting from that from that tax? You know, and sometimes you're also going, for instance, you're going to the airport or you're going to use some public places, they're asking you to pay money. Some of those staff will print their own receipts. Yeah. And this receipt they don't remit to the government. Mm. And the burden will be further put on the on the people. You know, the whole conversation we had before they it's remove, really you know, so yeah, it's, it's really important good. that this uh, uh, committee looks into it and have an open mind about it uh, 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 to be able to address the myriad of tax problems that we have in this country. All right, thank you very much, Faith. Now back to the big elephant in the room, why we brought you here, actually. Tomorrow, uh, International Day of the World's Indigenous People. Are we not going back to pre-Abuja era? If this kind of um, conversation is really coming up strongly with people like you. I also saw Professor Momodu, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Zikirinla, Professor Ademola Popola, Professor Jamila Nasir, quite, you know, uh, people who speak to power. Now saying, consider indigenous people. Does Abuja belong to anybody? Yes. Okay. Belo Abuja belongs to the indigenous people of the FCT. And you know why a lot of literature before now started saying Ab Abuja is a no man's land? Yes. Was because in 1976, those who actually came to carry out that survey misinformed. They didn't put their foot on the ground. They did aerial survey and found, and now went back to say there were no people in this place. There's no place in Nigeria where you don't have people. Every For it, other everywhere, place. everywhere you have people, indigenous people living in hamlets, living in villages, and all of that. You don't come and take an area picture and say this place is a no man's land. There's no virgin land in Nigeria. Even if there's a virgin land, the people who in Yabi that place will tell you that this place has never been farmed. That is if it has never been farmed in all of the years that Nigeria has been. So because of that narrative, you now come up to say, oh, Abuja is a no man's land. You know, we had Lagos once uh, as, uh, as the capital of uh, Nigeria, but you still recognize indigenous people of, uh, of Lagos state. You know that this person is an original, like they call them Omonile in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Lagos, mm. you know. So th those are the people. And because they have a culture, when you say an area is a no man's land, what you what you are trying to do is that you are trying to take away the culture of the people. You are taking away, you are trying to destroy the history of the people, so that the young ones coming up will not have a sense of belonging. <laughs>
West Africa and Africa right up to Sudan. Mm. Uh, these are regions that have become, this is a region that has become unstable and riddled with military government. It's unfortunate and uh, we would like to see a, a return to normal civilian administration. But again, we also have to consider the fact that, you know, in the process of trying to, you know, remedy the situation, we don't go to take extreme measures that would exacerbate the situation. To throw away the baby with the bathwater. With the bathwater. So in this situation, we have to look at, we have to be very careful. Very, we have to look at the issue gingerly. While we would want a restoration of the democratic space in Niger, which is, by the way, the last of the French dominoes. Oh, it's the last so far. Oh, well, I mean, in the Sahel region. In the Sahel region, yeah. yeah. Because we've already, Guinea has already fallen. Yes, gone. Burkina Faso, Mali, Chad, and uh, so Niger was just the last of the dominoes, and it has now fallen to military, uh, to, the, to the military junta. So it's quite something that, uh, and then in the case of Nigeria, which is, uh, which you know, fortuitously has the leadership of the ECOWAS by virtue of the, cham the, the chairman being the Nigerian president Bola Ahmed Tinubu, we have some specific issues that are natural to Nigeria and Niger that we have to be very careful about. If we try to, like we saw. We've yeah. seen that the action taken in Nigeria has had very, very serious effect in Niger. Especially the energy sector, as, as, which is also your yeah, area. Yeah, exactly. So definitely I can imagine that, you know, a country that is used to having 24 hours light, uh, electricity and energy. At the behest of Nigeria. At the behest of Nigeria now is having to do without. So and then, of course, it has, you know, effect on the living standards of the people that the livelihoods there as you can see from the photograph from the video the yeah. video report from by by the correspondent there so it's something that we have to be careful because there has been centuries of relationship between niger and nigeria and there's not much there's a lot of cultural links you know and all that economic links between us that predated the colonial uh, you know advent advent here so these are things that well we are we we should be we we, are, we should try to get the, the, the restoration of civilian administration in, in there we should try to also be careful about how we go about it so at not as you rightly said throw the baby with the bathwater. now as you rightly said quite a number of sanctions imposed on niger <clears throat> do you think it's necessary for ECOWAS and by extension nigeria to threaten military action at the first instance no i think that was you know that that is that is what i believe was, if you could call it, a four par from the current administration. And it's also as a result of not having a government in place. By government, I mean not having a cabinet in place. Because these are issues that definitely would benefit from debates, deep debates, when you have a cabinet. Mm. Because there will be issues to be discussed, there will be perspectives. And then, because the, the, the issue of, you know, mentioning military you know uh, action action mm. it's like putting the card before the horse yeah we have not yet exhausted diploma we have not even started the diplomatic process mm. and then you're introducing the issue of military intervention now whoever is listening to this whoever is observing this development we say ah, by virtue of introducing military before you even started the diplomatic uh, you know press aspect, yeah. aspect now would muddy the water so to speak mm. and then we create an alarm and a hardening of positions. So I would have thought that the best thing to have done was, okay, we are going to follow through the, you know, the, 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 the diplomatic process, the political process, the economic process, and saying, and then to even, you know, indicate that other options are also available without mentioning what those options are. Yeah. Then you can have the military junta whom you want to remove or whom we want to agree to restore democracy, to be amenable to discussions. Maybe on just how like what uh, the presidential spokesperson in Galele said yesterday, that um, they have slammed more sanctions using the CVR, but he didn't go into specifics. So exactly. He, yeah. he allows uh, many of us to keep speculating. You think maybe they should have done that at initial, instead of reading out all the, the, the sanctions and then putting the military option as the last one. Yeah, that's why, I mean, because military option in whatever circumstances is always a very sensitive and delicate issue because military action involves mobilization of troops, 
logistical, you know, uh, activities, and possibly so opportunity that over three trillion. If yeah. this war starts, and it possibly will death, over three trillion. death on both sides, mm. and that is something we should avoid. In as much as we want to have, uh, you know, um, a change of government in this country or a reasonable outcome in the situation, military option in this particular case will create more problems that it intends to solve. So it should not be something that should even be mentioned even before you started the diplomatic process. You should be able to say, OK, look, having gone, you, you subject the whole process to periodic review. And then once you get to the point where you are seeing no signs of progress, then you can begin to talk about military options. You don't talk about military options at the beginning of the journey. You talk about it when you see that as you move along, there has not been any compliance or any cooperation on the part of the people you want to see reason. And then you begin to introduce the military option. Then that is when it becomes very, very poignant to them that, look, something has to happen. We don't want to get to the brink. Mm. We want to stay at this stage and then be reasonable. And then, of course, on their part, when they hear that there is no talk yet of military options, then you can, they can begin to be amenable for discussions and for dialogue and, in fact, for favorable outcomes. And is it true that um, the media is actually adding, I mean, petrol to the fire by not really interpreting the position, the correct position of ECOWAS, the correct position of President Tinubu as Nigeria's leader, besides his strategic position as the chairman of ECOWAS? Because I'm saying he didn't actually talk about war. What he took to the National Assembly was the sanctions, which we have already seen, the blockage of the border, you know, uh, disconnecting Niger from electricity, and then most recently the action by the, the CBN. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you on that. And uh, that, I think, by my own assessment, yeah. is the, because we have an absence of seasoned public affairs personalities within the government as okay. it is right now. People who will have the nuance to discuss this issue in the light of, you know, what is happening. Yeah. And then to be able to temper some of the intentions of the government and be able to bring it to the space in a way that people would not be unnecessarily alarmed. That's why you need seasoned public affairs managers. Yeah. In this case, well, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm happy, I'm happy to say that this has not been availed this government because if you look at it has been a series of errors okay. in terms of conveying the yeah. president's uh, intentions messages. and messages on this issue and but you believe as a, as a person and as as president he will not contemplate invading nigeria no he wouldn't because he wouldn't because leading the air force to to do this he wouldn't because there is a lot of blowback potential blowback that could you know throw the baby, as he said, mm. with the bathwater. Right. And if you have to contemplate going on military, there are so many variables that you have to consider. Consider its effect on, there are seven states in, seven Nigerian states. Yes, that you have Sokoto, yes, you Zavara. have like, Kebi, you know, you have um, Kazina, you have um, uh, Jigawa, you have uh, Yobi, you have Boru. They have direct Links, links, cultural, there, economics. And then there are states in between, like Zamfara, like Kanu, you know, that, you know, they are contiguous to these states that share direct border with me. And don't so, forget, in fact, you cannot even isolate the whole of northern Nigeria from this. Exactly. That's why I believe Tinubu, as, you know, as, as, as somebody who has been through the mill, so mm. to speak, in politics, in public affairs, would not offhand think about military option, immediately this thing happens. Because there are so many variables that has to be considered. We have to first of all discuss extensively with the governors of those states. Yeah. Because this is a potential humanitarian issue exactly. coming in. And you have to look at what, how it will affect. Already we have that, those areas, some of those are, uh, states are unstable due to insecurity. Mm -hmm. And a number of Nigerians are also seeking refuge in Niger. And by the way, the measures we are taking now will also affect them.
The Economic Community of West Africa states ECOWAS has resolved to deploy troops to Niger to restore constitutional order in the country. The regional bloc has therefore directed its committee of chiefs of defense staff to activate its standby force and deploy it to Niger. The West African leaders reached the resolution on Thursday after an extraordinary summit in Abuja. To us, this is Daily Politics, and I'm your host, Hamza Idris. Now continuing with the discussion, as the regional bloc ECOWAS reaches these decisions, there, are, uh, there has been bickers and outright disapproval from voices in the north over any attempt to use military intervention. However, Kendi Amodu is with us in the studio. He's the State House correspondent for Trust TV and will be giving us more details of what happened during the second extraordinary summit on social political situation in Niger Republic, which held at the presidential villa in Abuja. Welcome to the program. Uh, Thank Kendi. you for having me. All through the day you've been in the villa. What how was the ambience? Well, there's the, the, the ECOWAS leader seemed um, determined to reach a, a resolution that would show a strong stance against the uh, junta in uh, Niger. That's because the Nigerian military authorities, if we can call them that. Exactly. Even though they have their name, they call themselves National Council for the Safeguard of the Homeland. Of the home. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They have rebuffed all uh, peaceful attempts. All entreaties. Yeah. All en entreaties and so. Um, the West Le uh, African leaders also decided to show a strong stance. Maybe a, a kind of show of force. It's a show of force. This is reminiscent to what happened in uh, Gambia. Yes. You know, when they asked, when there was, you know, issues what? around, uh, they, they agreed to now, you know, extend. Yeah the force yes. and that uh, before you know the you know is a cantankerous or a calcitrant leader now he backed out right uh, and and went into exile yes so um i think the, the the point there is that the west african leaders are also uh saying that peace is not ruled out so there's still um there's still room for negotiations there's still room for dialogue for instance, uh, yesterday evening, President Tenobu met with the, the Ulama Council. Exactly. And, and gave them the go ahead. He to, also met with 14th Emir of Kano. Yes. Yeah, Sanusi. Sanusi, and he gave them the go ahead to go and find a peaceful resolution in this thing. So I think that the, the deployment of troops, as they have agreed today, is the last resort if all other measures fail. My concern is that there is a clear departure from the introductory or welcome address by President Tinubu. Because if you, if you go through the speech, he didn't mention force at all. But uh, he emphasized negotiation, diplomatic ways to resolve this problem. But later in the evening, when the communique came out, we now saw the resolve by the regional bloc to now deploy um, troops to restore democracy in Niger. Don't you think Tinubu is actually in a tight corner? You have to understand the position he's in. Um, there are voices from across the northern part of the country that say these people are brothers who will not... ACF, we, you can see uh, yeah. the ulama, yeah. quite a number of um, groups. We do not advise that war uh, be taken to Niger. But you also have to understand that President Tinubu is the president of Nigeria. There are, the, uh, today, there are eight other presidents, plus two presidents uh, from West Africa, then two other presidents from, uh, one uh, from Burundi, yeah. uh, who were observers. Exactly. Which clearly shows that this is not his decision alone to take. Yes. So, while, you know, um, if, you, if you recall, some days ago, his special advisor on media and publicity had actually tried to um, change the narrative. Yes. To say that, look, this is not a decision that is taken by President Tinubu alone. That all West African leaders 
are taking this decision. Yeah, it a just collective happens, decision. It's a collective decision. It just happens to be the chairman, and therefore, a, since it's an authority, the chairman is the spokesperson. But you see, what people believe in diplomacy, you know, we say America is the police of the world. Right? Yeah. So even UN, sometimes you see their resolutions and all that without the, the, the approval of the United States, nocturnally, you know, mm -hmm. they rarely agree on some of those things. Yes. And do you think Tinubu has played his card very well for them to arrive at where we are now? You know, before we get to the point of a, a communique, let's also remember that there are um, closed door sessions. Exactly. There are briefings. Today they were briefed by the different uh, groups. Yeah, groups. yeah, yeah. Delegations. Including the, the envoys. Yeah, sent including to, the envoys. As far as uh, Algeria, Algeria, right? Algeria. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, 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 Libya. Yeah. Libya. Yes. So there's been a briefing. There is also uh, this uh, shuttle, this diplomatic shuttle. It's not, it also goes beyond Africa. Mm. They would have sent a, 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 an envoy even if it is under the cloak of the night, to France, to US, to UK, to find out what their mindset is before they take a decision like this. I, I keep on saying that ECOWAS would not take a decision and not preclude force if they don't have the backing of all these international organizations. Yeah, certainly, you know, France, US, they have all shown their commitment to support restoration by whatever means in in niger republic yes. but um now what is your thought about um humanitarian crisis that is actually knocking at nigeria's doors from sokoto to kazina you know kebi to yobe you know you have jigawa you have about almost six or seven states apart from contigo state that will also be added uh, and, and remember, states that don't have really strong borders, in which people will cross over. Yes. Very easily. I don't think if any of these states has any strong border, because by the time you say there is war, there is no way you will stop people from... They're already crossing you, over. They're, they're already, already with, yeah. with us here, in all the border towns. Some, some, some of them have families in Nigeria and in Niger. Yeah. So, you know, you know, the humanitarian crisis, that is why a lot of the persons in the North have warned that if you go to war, yeah. or if West Africa goes to war with Niger, if it is not speedily resolved, oh. the humanitarian yeah. implications will not be nice for Nigeria. A large number of supporters of the coup gathered close to a French military base in Niger on Friday. This came after leaders from West African nations had announced their intention to assemble a standby force to be deployed to assist in reinstating the Ustate leader of the country. There are increasing concerns for the safety of the deposed president, Mohamed Bazoum, who was removed from power by members of his own guard on July 26. Reports indicate that the conditions of his detention are worsening. However, the protesters near the base on the outskirts of the capital, Niamey, were seen chanting slogans against France and the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS. Many of the demonstrators displayed flags of Russia and Niger while expressing their support for the new leader, General Abdurrahman Chiani. Also, Niger's junta has threatened to kill Usted President Bazoum if neighboring countries attempt any military intervention to reinstate him. According to a report by the Associated Press on Thursday, two Western officials said the coup leaders issued the threat while speaking to a top U.S. diplomat. This came shortly after ECOWAS said it had directed the deployment of troops to restore democracy in Niger after its deadline of Sunday to restore Bazoum's government Expired. The threat to the deposed president raises the stakes both for ECOWAS and for the junta, which has shown its willingness to escalate its actions since it seized power on July 26. 
Viewers, this is Daily Politics, and I'm your host, Hamza Idris. As you know, Friday's episode of Daily Politics is dedicated to you, our esteemed viewers, to call in and share your thoughts on issues relating to politics, policy, and governance, and that is affecting our lives. So today, we look forward to hearing from you as conversations continue to emanate from the July 26 coup in Niger. However, in the studio with me today to do the analysis is Jamilo Mohamed. He's an economic analyst and an auto. He also has vast interests, you know, in the politics in the Africa region. Welcome to the program, Jamilo. Thank you for having me. We're happy having you. Thank you for having me. Yes, we'll take a short break and uh, when we return, we start the conversation. Don't go away. Yes, Jamilo, I am concerned that um, the junta in Niger appear unperturbed, looking by in how sad they say it's not Ching Karansu Baba Baka. Just today, you no know, governors have started, you know, going to their domains, like the one in Damagaram, you know. They have gone to, you know, meet the people to a rousing welcome. And this is just a day or two after you know, um, the, the new leader, you know, formed government, 21 cabinet members, beside the prime minister. Why do you think they have this confidence? Uh, thank you very much for having me. I think uh, their confidence is uh, based on uh, fundamentally two issues. Okay. Number one is uh, the issue of uh, the type of democracy we run. Um, I don't know if uh, the definition of uh, democracy, the government of the people by the people for the people, uh, if we are to go by this, uh, I don't know if the number of people they see is a referendum okay. about their own stake in government, that the people have accepted uh, uh, the coup. Are you saying so that say. maybe it's up, you know, they, 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 they use, you know, tailored... Yes, um, you see, I think, uh, you know, we, we, we look at the timeline of the coup. Yes, from 26 uh, years. Yes, when it started, the actual military was not involved. It was like... Presidential a, a, guard. A pre presidential guard. Yeah. It was like a palace coup that was taking place. Now... After about 12 hours or beyond 12 hours, maybe those guards were able to convince the larger military. Because at first, the larger military was, was uh, a yeah. kind of trying to exactly. resist. So they were able to now convince them the reason for the coup. You see, it might not have been the guard itself that convinced the military. Ah. The, yes, there would have been forces, forces behind the scene that were playing at the script. Possibly they knew if the military, the larger military was involved, the thing would have leaked. That was why they started with the guard itself. And you know, the, 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 the main issue, what people are saying is, there was, there was a, coup, a, a coup in the often. Yeah. Not this particular coup. Mm. This particular coup is actually... It was locking around. It, 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 it was locking around. The, the other coup was locking around. This is just like a counter coup, while that coup had not even taken place. You mean, you mean the one staged by the... By, by Abdurrahman Chiani. Yeah. It's actually a counter coup. Okay. Yes. The, that's the feelers uh, we are having. The actual coup, you see, Abdurrahman Chiani is being backed largely by, uh, diplomatically, by the Russians. Okay. Now, you can see the hands of the Russians in Mali, in Central African Republic. In Guinea, that's why, huh? in Guinea, that's why Mali and Burkina Faso in particular yes. came out boldly to say, we are with Niger. Yeah. Because they without have, apology. Without apology. Yes. They, they all have one single godfather. And we believe that is Russia. But don't okay. you think Russia is by gaining more than it can chew? Look at what well, is happening there. You see, still it, unable to subdue to be, Ukraine. It, it, well, it used to be the Cold War we used to know between the Soviets and, and the West. 
Now it is no more the Cold War. It is still the same ideological issues between Russia and the West. That is exactly what is playing out. That is exactly what played out in, or what is playing out in uh, Ukraine. You see, uh, Russia knew how the West, through NATO, yeah. was trying to convince Ukraine, okay, join us. So that we can so that collectively, collectively demolish Russia. Demolish Russia. Yeah. Russia said, no, I cannot have an enemy in my backyard. It's so not possible. I, I would not, I will tolerate, not that. tolerate that. I can tolerate NATO around Europe, no problem, but not in my own backyard. Ukraine, don't bring NATO close, close to, to my you. doorstep. Ukraine said, no, we are going to join NATO. And by their own charter, if they join, in fact, even before that, uh, uh, Russian intelligence knew there were certain biological institutional sites, wow. so to say, in Ukraine been built and run by NATO. So uh, is, is it that now they are fighting proxy war in Niger? It, that is exactly what is happening. You see, Nigeria's predicament is Nigeria allowed this thing to happen too fast. And I think we have actually reached a point of no return. I, I saw one of two, your articles where you said Nigeria has already lost this battle. Yes. What do you mean? What I mean here is, if, if Bazoum is there, already we have America having about three military bases in Niger. Three? Three. Two are drone bases. One is a tactical command base. So if we have America, uh, America came there in the name of fighting terrorism. Yeah. Right? When they came at first, they came to Ghana. Ghana was not ready to accommodate them. It denied them base. It denied them base. Then now, it said, what we will do is, we will allow your military presence in a certain place, and then we will monitor. Since you want to fight terrorism, you will monitor, and then we will exchange intelligence between us. Yeah. Then America said, no, that is not what they wanted. They went to Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso told them the same thing, and refused them that those particular bases they wanted. When they came to Niger, Niger outrightly gave them everything. Wow. So it's like us two having, so to say, an enemy in our own backyard. I'm not saying the U.S. is an enemy in any yeah, case. Yeah, but, but in I diplomatic do, terms. In diplomatic terms, yeah. there is no reason why U.S. will not work with us 100% in sharing intelligence and sharing our military capabilities. And the big question now, this. yeah, based on this, why, despite having three bases, yes. that is U.S., yes. you know, uh, France also has its own base, right? Yeah. Yes. And they must have this intelligence. Why did they allow the coup to happen? No, they didn't allow the coup to happen. I say it was a counter coup. They had their own coup in the offing, but they were only trying to be... You tell us about theirs then. You see, okay... You can, you, can, you, can, you can see the vast of mineral resources. Yes. The spread, uranium. Uranium. Even, uh, even uh, oil, you know. Even, yes. Yes. And that is even the problem uh, of Boko Haram. Which stretched to the Lake Chad the region. The Lake Chad region into Cameroon, into Central African Republic. All this now. This is our sub-Saharan sub region. The kind of mineral resources that are there. Uh, they, 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 it used to be in, uh, um, in uh, Liberia, yes. where we had blood Gold. diamonds. Yeah. Blood diamonds. Now, they went there, created problems. Whenever there is this bloodshed, hmm, yeah. they come in and begin mining. Mining the minerals and going. This is exactly the problem we are now having in Congo. Congo, what is the problem in Congo is a proxy... War oh. between these Western nations and Russia, eh? and then diplomatic or economically with China, mm. trying to exploit our natural resources in Africa. That is exactly what is happening. Wow. So that is what we have lost now in Nigeria. Mm. Because 
the military presence we don't want yeah. is already there. It's inching closer. It's, no, it is already there. Oh of my course. God, then what about, what about the other, which of the French colonies are now survivors? The, you, 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 you would hardly have one. What, which is Cameroon, see, right? Yes. You, you see, even Cameroon, I don't want to see uh, Cameroon as having uh, uh, survived. Uh, how how Cam do you mean? You see... It's a dicey Paul, situation? Paul, Paul, Paul Bia is almost gone. Because yes. of his age? His age and, and frail and health and conditions. Health conditions. He is not there. That is the throat. Wow. And now... In practical the, terms. In practical terms, he is not there. But the problem the uh, France and the West are having in Cameroon is that they don't have somebody who, have, who they have sprung up to take the place of Paul Bia. You are referring to France? They, yes. They didn't groom. They, they, so. There is nobody groomed. And the, op the opposition there is very strong. If anything moves Paul Bia now, yeah. the opposition will take over. And the op uh, and will not throw it there. Russia will cash in. Wow. You see, Russia is playing the, 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 the vulture game, the opportunist. Once there's a problem, they just cash in and just go in. If They don't even care about coming to build their own military might anywhere. Wow. Yes. All they know is that there are problems. Our colonial... And they are closely monitoring, monitoring. the problems. They are monitoring the then problems. Then who is our friend now? I mean, when you put Russia, you put US, you put... You know, France, you see, we, all of these we, we superpowers. Do, we, we do not have any of them. Friend. No, we do not have. The, meaning they all, all have all, their interests. They all have their interests. The only thing is we Africans would have to build our own diplomacy around sectors. We say, okay, we want infrastructure. China is giving us infrastructure. But China also has its own interests. It, it has its like own it, interests. There is this allegation see, that what they are actually getting, mining, you know, our vast you see, land they, they, far they, outweigh what we are they, getting they, from them. They, they have a global interest. They have a global program they have built that they are working on. When China came and said it will build the Mambila Hydro, hmm, yes. it is only one aspect of it. Now, what they are doing is, you see, power. Yes. Iron and steel, education, I've always said, these three things, if we will get these three things right, we have no problem, we can, we, can, we can rule the world. 